guest today is Her Royal Highness Princess Michael of Kent, who, if I may say so, is a good friend and a very loyal friend. We've known each other some years now. Many years. And uh, <laughs> she is not only a princess, but a historian, very accomplished historian, about to produce the first book in a trilogy in the 15th century entitled The Queen of Four Kingdoms. That's right, The Queen of Four Kingdoms, and it's my first novel. But it's a historically, factually yes, based novel. To totally. Yeah. Yes. And, and you've had a number of other careers. You were an interior decorator at the time you uh, yes, joined indeed. the royal family. <laughs> I was an interior designer. Uh, I came to England to learn that because you couldn't in Austria. Mm -hmm. And um, having spent a month here for a friend's wedding, I thought this is a pretty good place at the end of the 60s to come. Yes. So I thought if I study something I can't study in Austria, then I have a good excuse to come. And I was an apprenticed interior designer for a number of years till I had my own company. And then um, I was very successful because being a, a, a good hun, I suppose, I was <laughs> always on time, yes. which not a lot of interior designers are. My jobs were already on time and within the estimate. And sometimes I gave refunds, which just blew the client's mind. <laughs> Be because I'd assume things I've never things heard of such a thing. Uh, well, <laughs> well, sometimes I assumed prices would go up and they didn't, so yes. they got a refund. And so I was very successful. I was no better than any of my contemporaries who are the big designers of today in England. Um, but I was just had this little edge of being on time and within estimate. And, um, and I earned a lot of money, yes. I, mm. I did very well. And when you became a member of the royal family, that was a problem, was it? Well, I didn't think it would be. Nobody mm -hmm. said it would be. And my husband was in the army then. And I thought I would continue um, because my husband didn't have a civil list. He was a second son. Mm -hmm. And um, he wasn't going to get a civil list, presumably. Who knew? Um, but I thought I would be continuing. And, and when I came back, um, it was made apparent to me that it wasn't appropriate. Now, we're talking 35 years ago yes. for, at the time, for a royal princess to be in <coughs> trade buying and selling, you know. And um, so I was rather dismayed by that because I said, well, who's going to comp compensate me for my loss of income? Well, that was my problem, I was informed. So I ran crying to my mother who said, well, darling, you studied history. Why not write history books? Nobody can argue with that, really, mm -hmm. if you're writing history. So I've, I wrote three history books. Mm -hmm. They took me five years each because I'm very slow. I research everything because I like no, you're very little, little details, the little personal details. Uh, what about the um, controversy, if that's the right word for it, over you uh, being a Roman Catholic? Yes, well, it was much more difficult 35 years ago. I mm -hmm. think times have changed a lot. Um, it wasn't popular in some uh, sections uh, of the family at all. The young don't care, you no. know. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of... I find there's not a lot of spiritual interest among the young uh, today. But when I was newly married, it, it was still a problem, but it's a historical Most problem. Most religiosity in this country is either Roman Catholic or Muslim now. Now, yeah. yes. But of course, the law under which I fell of 1702, the law mm. of succession that no, no member of the royal family may marry a Roman Catholic, is still the law. Um, they always say they're going to change it, but they mm. haven't. Um, and um, I don't really see but They much couldn't even point. have a Roman Catholic Attorney General until Margaret Thatcher. I remember. You know? yeah. I remember that well. And you know, my son um, went to... My, my children are not allowed by law to be Catholic. Mm -hmm. um, but my husband's terribly fair, and we did alternate Sundays, Catholic and Anglican. Mm -hmm. At Christmas, we do Midnight Mass Catholic, and we do the day service Anglican. And, um, you know, this is... You know, it's always worked yes. both ways. Mm -hmm. um, my daughter hasn't been confirmed. She didn't want to be confirmed in the Anglican faith. And um, I think if she fell in love with a Catholic, she might. I don't mm -hmm. know, but she might. Mm -hmm. My son is very Anglican. Mm -hmm. And if he's as good an Anglican as my husband, my goodness, they're more religious than I am, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody's Catholic in Austria, so you take it for granted. It's yes. not... Catholics here had to struggle to be Catholics. That's a historical yes. situation. Yes. Whereas I've always taken it terribly for granted, you know. Now, the, um, we have all suffered at the hands of the London media at times, but uh, <laughs> uh, they're not bothering you now, are they? Look, what 
do the media do? You having been a great media baron, you know, mm. they have to sell newspapers. Mm. And they have a lot of competition yes, nowadays. They, they don't have to defame people to do it. Um, well, if I do something they don't like, mm -hmm. um, they'll write it. Mm -hmm. Or if they're mm -hmm. told a story that they think is true, they don't have time to check it out because they've got to get out a headline every day, haven't they? <laughs> so um, I think I'm too old to be interesting now. Well, you, know? well, you underestimate yourself. But no, no, but I mean, I think that the young are much more interesting um, the to younger the royals. media. Yeah, well, that could be. Well, speaking of that, I mean, obviously you, you would not be indiscreet, and, and I wouldn't encourage you to be anyway, but for the benefit of Canadian viewers, could you give us any recollections of, for example, Princess Diana? She lived right near here. She was my next door neighbor. Yeah. And um, I must say, I was very, very fond of her, very attached to her. She had an enormous amount of goodness in her. Um, and like probably many people of little education who find themselves in, I mean, I think of pop stars or, or film stars who are suddenly lauded by the whole world. It's very difficult if you haven't had a mother bring you up mm -hmm. who was quite stern and strict. Um, she didn't have a mother bring her up. Um, and she didn't have much education. Mm -hmm. So it's much harder to cope with eulogy, I'm guessing now, because I had a very strict mother. <laughs> and also, I didn't have anything like her eulogy. And I think that uh, Diana was wonderful with the people. She had this, this famous common touch. She yes. was marvelous with the people. But then to be on your own and to have not really a terrific support group, if you like. Uh, that um, office of hers were I'm sorry? jolly, the, her office were jolly hockey stick Sloan Rangers. I yes, mean, th but th they, they were amateurs. her class ever, yeah. ever. I mean, you know, I mean, they were <coughs> very nice and lovely girls, very but nice, they, yeah. they weren't in her position. How could they be in her position? Mm. And, and um, she didn't sort of have, she had her two sisters, but they were on, you know, sort of doing their, their thing. But she was the youngest mm -hmm. and she was on her own and, and her mother went to Australia when she was 10 years old or something. Yeah. And that's tough. I think that's tough. Yeah, no, and, I, I know. and Sarah Ferguson had the same thing. I mean, her yes. mother went off to to Buenos Aires or something yeah. when she was very yes. young. So, yeah. I mean, I think that to have had a strong mother is the thing. And my heroine, Yolande, was a very strong mother to her children and her foster children. And I think that's why they all turned out so well. Did, would you comment on the uh, Cambridges? I'm sorry? The, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, certainly would you not. comment what on? What do you think you're doing asking me about? No, certainly not. Don't comment well, I, on I, members I, of the I, royal family, certainly not. Man is dead. <laughs> History is no, dead. No, no, you know. no, 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 History is talking about dead people. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, but you can, you can I make a completely benign comment. I wouldn't well, expect any other. Well, of course. But I mean, we're thrilled, of course, <laughs> to have um, a beautiful young married mm -hmm. couple with a baby just a month older than my first grandchild, mm. <laughs> which I'm very excited about, although she lives in America, but she'll be here for Christmas. Um, and let's hope there are more marriages mm -hmm. soon, you know, because mm -hmm. I think to have young generation is terribly good for the people. You know, people love to see happy young people. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, the older generations are a bit boring for most people. You know? Well, I don't know about that. You know, I mean, look at the tremendous well, interest. I mean, look at us. Well, yeah, <laughs> you, anyway. But, uh, the, the Queen Mother had a huge following right to the huge end. Huge following, yeah. huge following, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, but they, I mean, look, I don't know them at all, but are, are they as they appear, just an attractive young couple? They're very attractive. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, look at the photographs, very attractive. Don't <laughs> yeah. you talk to me about members of the royal family. I you know, know perfectly know. well I'm not going to talk about the royal family. <laughs> well, I, I'm certainly not, as I said, seeking anything now. indiscreet. That's what we're getting to, now. yes, that's what we're getting <laughs> to. Very well then, let's uh, take the leap from the Cambridges to Yolande. Will you tell us about your book? It's called The Queen of Four Kingdoms. Yes. She was called Yolande d'Aragon, Yolande of mm. Aragon, mm. before Aragon joined with Castile mm -hmm. to make what we see know today as Spain. Mm -hmm. And um, Aragon had been for quite some time, nearly 100 years, at war um, with Anjou, which was a, a royal duchy in France. 
um, over the inheritance of the kingdom of Naples and Sicily, yes. which um, was left to both Aragon and to Anjou by the mad, yes, mad, last queen of Naples and Sicily. Um, was who, that Joan the mad? Joan. Oh, she yes. Was Joan. No, she was Joan. She really was mad. Giovanna. Yeah. Um, she was very licentious, too. Yeah. Giovanna. But she came from a family called Dura, and the Italians turned that into Durazzo. Mm -hmm. And that was a senior branch of the Anjou family. Um, of France, and so that was their reason for inheriting. And at some point, she decided that Aragon was a better heir to that kingdom. And so, having left it to both of them at various times and then annulled it, the last heir was Anjou, but Aragon wouldn't have it. So the widow of Aragon decided to marry her daughter to the to the heir of Anjou, and that is Yolande, who marries Louis II and, of Anjou. And she is a central figure in this book. You're She's just bringing the central out now. Figure because although she's very self-effacing and doesn't take credit for anything, she's actually responsible for bringing the Hundred Years' War to an end. She's responsible for, the, uh, for Joan of Arc's existence. Mm. She's, she found her. She's responsible for all the great characters of the time in a way because she brought them up in her, in her great but chateau. But did she have a sense of French nationality and well, the French expelling French. the English? No, her mother was of the French <coughs> royal family, so she was half, she was half French. So she had a great knowledge of France, its problems and its virtues. How far do you go, I mean, do you actually get the French victory in the Hundred Years' War? I beg your pardon? In what you're writing about. Um, uh, what did you get to the French victory in the Hundred Years' War? Well, in the third book, I uh -huh, do. I see. Uh -huh. <laughs> in the third well, book, Well, this is I an immense undertaking do. then. Well, it's been seven years. Yeah. I started wanting, but... But, you but you're, you're, then you're presenting over a century of European history. More or less, yeah. not quite. I'm a bit short in the beginning, a bit short at the end, um, because uh, the story finishes, starts with one character, that the first book is Yolande, ends with her death. The second book is a lovely lady called Agnès Sorel, mm. who she trains, actually, to look after her son-in-law, the king, because she knows that Burgundy is going to kill those two older sons. Mm. So she grabs the third son and marries him to her daughter. And, of course, he becomes the Dauphin, and he becomes the king, crowned by Joan of Arc. So you were actually leading a, a, a refocusing and 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 a semi-popularized approach to a period of history that that that, that has, has been relatively not concentrated on for well, quite a while. Well, I want. I mean, you're know, a pioneer here. I want ordinary people to be able to yes. read this, not just scholars. Of course. And and I think it's no, a very I, I, interesting time. I reproach time. myself for not having grasped until this moment the scale of what you're doing. I mean, this is a vast undertaking. Yes, but it's my pleasure. Yes, of course. No, I understand. You I, know, it's, I, my, it's my fun. It's well, my we, mother was we, a historian. Uh, we, we authors, We authors. Yeah. Um, my mother was a historian. <coughs> so our childhood's uh, entertainment, if you like, was stories from history. I descend from everybody in this book. Yes. I don't bother to, to show it, but there's a website. You know, on my website, you can look it all up if you want. I mean, it's only interesting for genealogists. And so I heard all these stories, yes. but not so much this story. I heard about Joan of Arc, from whom I do not descend, but it was Yolande who found Joan of Arc because her son was married, she arranged, to the heiress of the Lorraine. In the Lorraine is Doremi, from where nice. came Joan of Arc. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Are you an admirer of Joan of Arc? Oh, yes, enormously. But do you see... Do you think she had a military talent or was she no, just no, a no, spiritually inspired she people? Person. She didn't do anything at all. I mean, what... <laughs> no, no, no. Joan Nothing didn't fight. All, Let's forget all the statues of Joan with the sword. You know, I've seen the sword. I couldn't pick it up myself and I'm a pretty strong girl, you know. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. <laughs> what Yulon did, which was so clever, she was one of the early PR experts, really. First of all, um, she had very few people realize that um, when her son, in whose territory, the Lorraine, um, this girl who wanted to save France was boring everyone to death, that she yes. wanted to save France. And Orléans was besieged, and so he wrote to his mother at Chinon with the court, saying, Mom, look, there's this girl here who wants to save France. I mean, what do you think? I mean, he was all of, sort of 16 years old at the time. Would you like to see her? Send her to me. They arrived at Chinon. And Yolande kept her, 
secret, hidden for two days. Very few people know that. And quizzed her and quizzed her to make sure she was for real. You know, mm -hmm. people hear voices, you know, in those days. Many people heard mm -hmm. voices. There was a legend that a virgin from Lorraine would save France. There was that legend mm -hmm. um, that was a sort of old wives' tale legend. After two days of quizzing her, Yolande decided that she was for real. And you see, the king, she brought him up from the age of 10, betrothed to her daughter, aged eight, um, called her ma bonne mère, my good yeah, mother. Yeah. And he believed in her, totally, always obeyed her. When she was around, he obeyed her. When she wasn't around, he was bad. So uh, she, he didn't meet, see Joan of Arc for two days, didn't know really about her, until Yolande decided, yes, I, I believe in you, I mm -hmm. trust you. Now, what you're going to do is raise the siege of Orléans. Perhaps the girl didn't even know where Orléans was. You know, how am I going to do that? With my army. I've already turned the army of Anjou. They were marching to Marseille to go to my son in Naples, who needs them badly. I've already turned them. We'll meet them in Bourges. And then, clever girl, dressed her in white like a novice to go in to see the king. Of course, the king and his wicked young courtiers, as we know from all the plays and films, had popped somebody else on his throne and he mm. himself had hid so they could all laugh at this girl of 17 who'd come to save France. And um, one of the young men from, from Yolande's entourage that she'd brought up came to her and said, listen, this is what the king's done. So it wasn't Joan of Arc being clever that she said, no, that's not my dauphin on the throne. They said, go and greet your king, greet your king. No, his, his He's over there, behind that pillow. He's over there, mm -hmm. behind the pillar. Red socks, blue shoes, whatever. And went down on one knee, dressed as a novice nun, all in white, one knee with her hand on her heart. The king was impressed. Some people were impressed, not everybody, but some people were impressed. And he took her aside and chucked off the page on the throne and they talked and, and everybody had to go on talking. And then some wag from the court shouted out, and how are you planning to relieve Orléans then. Mm -hmm. And she said, with my army. And all this is written down mm -hmm. by people who were there, you know. And so what army is that? Ha, ha, ha. They knew the king didn't have an army. Mm -hmm. And she said, why? The army of Anjou. Now that they knew was a working army because they'd been fighting in Naples on and off mm -hmm. for Yolande's husband until he died and fighting for the son. That was a real army, mm -hmm. the army of Anjou. So then the king realized that Yolande was behind this girl. So he looked for her and summoned her. And so then he believed in Joan of Arc because mm. of Yolande, you see? see. And then Yolande um, had sold all her gold and silver unbeknown to anybody to pay for turning an army. I mean, it's a big thing, mm. you know? Armies are expensive. Huh? Big thing. And then they met at Bourges. They met the army at, at Bourges. She sent for her son, who the army knew. What does she do then? She puts Joan of Arc on a great big white charger in a white armor that she's arranged for her. This slip of a girl gives her an enormous great silken white flag with a red cross of Lorraine and says, you're going to sit on a hill out of arrow range, but in view of Orléans with a dozen good men around you and you're be going to be an icon for the army fighting to relieve Orléans. And when they all arrived in Bourges and the army of Anjou saw this girl on this huge white horse and all in white with this great white flag, they were already in awe of her because mm -hmm. they'd heard about, you know, the very superstitious mm -hmm. time still. Mm -hmm. And of course she led them to Orléans and sat on the hill and inspired them, you see? This was Joan's mm. job, was to inspire. What do you, I mean obviously you're British now, but what do you consider yourself you know, originally oh, to totally be? totally Central European. Yeah, I mean, uh, but we have to be more specific. Uh, well, my mother's half Hungarian, half Austrian, yeah. born in Austria from an Austrian mother mm -hmm. with a Hungarian father who was the Austro-Hungarian ambassador to St. Petersburg in 1914. It was his job mm. to declare war after Sarajevo, yeah. which he was very against because he kept sending telegrams, we'll lose, we'll lose, you know, we mustn't <laughs> declare war. <laughs> but, um, and then, yeah. um, and it's quite, I mean, you know, yeah. I, I've got quite a lot a of, lot of history in my yeah. life. But no, I'm a typical child of the empire, you know, I was brought up. You mean of the Habsburg Empire? Yes. yes. Um, 
It was astounding the they, they, that, 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 I know they about kept that. that ramshackle empire going for 700 years. You know. Well, just playing off the different groups against each other. I think that's a very, very much the Canadian historian's attitude. I think there was a lot of <laughs> benevolence. I, I, I think there was I, a lot I, of benevolence, I, Conrad. Oh, I agree, <laughs> and it's much better than what's come after it. I didn't mean ramshackle pejoratively. It, I meant difficult to coordinate all those different ethnic groups and nationalities. Well, I, th I think the point was. I mean, that they calling didn't it the Holy try. Roman Empire and carrying it on as long as they did was, was you know, and when Andrassy. Uh, you know, but there was I benevolence. Remember, I, I, I wasn't disputing. No, no, no. That. But I mean, I'm actually the rather an admirer of that. <laughs> well, I, I, I think very much of my own family. Duty was a concept that was mm. inbred. Mm -hmm. You don't hear the word duty here very often. It's my duty. I must do this because it's my duty. You know, mm. duty was a concept that was inbred to the aristocracy, and they carried it out. And it wasn't th the same in Russia, where you owned the souls of people. You no, talked no, about no, how many no. souls. I, and, well, and, and you didn't have serfs and things like that. No, no, no. We right. had peasantry. Of course we had yeah, peasantry. Yeah, no, but that was different. They weren't indentured um, like that. But, but yeah. you know, I think there was a lot of feeling of, these are my family. Mm -hmm. You know, the people who work for you, you looked after. Uh, I think and that's I, why it existed. I, 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 I'm, I'm failing to um, make myself clear. I think it is astonishing and magnificent <laughs> that they managed to keep uh, Italians, Hungarians, Austrians, Slovenians, some S Serbs and other Slavs, some Romanians, Poles of different kinds, um, Moravians, mm -hmm. Slovaks, all of them, and, and, and some Germans too, all of them sort of pulling together for all the time they yes, get. Yes, but and I resist think the, the irredentism and the nationalism. Mm, the, well, the I think nationalism grew also later, didn't it? I mean, 19th century was the century of nas the rise of nationalism, mm. really, 1848 and all that. Um, but I think also there was a mythical concept to the role of the emperor. Yes. The emperor was definitely appointed by God. No? Mm. The, well, the, the Holy Roman Empire. Yeah, yes, I mean, and, and, and... Notorious that it was none of those things. And they were not... The, the, the emperors were really very benign and, and did their best for their countries. And I think most aristocrats did the best for their territories as well, as they did in, in, in my last book in the 15th century. I mean, you were sovereign of your dukedom. Of course. And you looked after it because it's where your income came from. So you weren't going to torture your people. No, no, no. When now, I married are, you, are you an admirer of Metternich? I'm afraid very much because mm. of his genius. I'm not an admirer necessarily of all that he did, but he was a very, very clever man. Mm. And depending on whose side you on, you're on, you know, um, um, I, you know, I would like to have always been on his side because he was cleverer than anyone else. Um, mm. I mean, as clever. Well, as, Talleyrand was pretty clever. Talleyrand. Mm. Talleyrand uh, you know, I'm a great fan of Talleyrand because <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I very much believe, well, he got <laughs> away with everything, didn't yeah. he? But I very much <coughs> believe when he said that if you haven't lived in the middle of the 18th century, you don't understand the douceur de vivre, <laughs> the sweetness of life. Yeah. And I think that's true for the center center of the 18th century, which was the time, of course, of Madame de Pompadour and, and Louis Quinze in France, and France was the most civilized country in the world. Yes, yes. And, 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 he, and he served every regime, as you know. I mean, he started mm. as a bishop, and, and when he died, he required the sacrament of the dying given to the bishop, you know, with oil yes. on his hand. And yes, yes. I mean, no, Talleyrand is, is another one of my heroes, I have to say. Um, but you've, you've written about so many of your heroes. I confess I've only really written in depth about women to date. Mm. But the third in my trilogy, The Queen of Four Kingdoms, 15th century France. This 15th century is a very interesting time, mm. I think, pre-Reformation, yes. pre- Well, we don't um, really approve of the Reformation, you know. When you say we, <laughs> are you talking as a Canadian historian? Oh, no. <laughs> I was speaking in a sectarian way. A sectarian one. Yeah. Well, it's not a question of approving it. It's, mm -hmm. it's how it changed the world. Uh, before Reformation and before Renaissance, in the following century, which was my last book, you had a completely different life. So you were much more superstitious and much more inclined to believe in somebody who hears voices like mm. Joan of Arc mm. uh, uh, said she did. And well, Canada and had a prime minister for 22 years who heard voices. He used to communicate all the time with dead people, even s those he didn't know. 
Mackenzie King. Yes. I mean, the man, he, was a, he was mad, but he was a very successful prime minister, 22 years. I don't mean years. you say that so glibly, mad. I no, mean no, I, I, I don't <laughs> mean it glibly, I, and, and that's not quite, he was very eccentric, and he was in some respects slightly mad, but, uh, but not necessarily for the reason yeah. I gave. But uh, no, I, do, I wouldn't say that glibly, and certainly not about him. I'm rather an admirer of his. Where did you meet your husband? Well, Lord Mountbatten, mm -hmm. I'm sure he's a concept to Canadians, um, <laughs> the great Lord you, Mountbatten. You, you need to keep addressing me as a Canadian as if no, I was no, but, a, no, but never I'm, left but this the is for Canadian Northwest television, Territories no? or something. This is yeah, for indeed, Canadian for the viewers. Yeah. Well, no, he's a familiar figure in Canada. Yeah, so all right. Two of my cousins married, one his niece and one his nephew, within a fairly short time when I was young, uh, within the same year, and I went to both these weddings, and he was very friendly, or became very friendly, with a young aunt of mine, so he enjoyed talking to her. And she was terrified, and so she hung on to me and said, you know, my niece is going to be studying in England very soon. And um, uh, so finally the poor man, after two uh, three-day weddings, said, well, you must look me up when you come to England. I didn't know that the English say that sort of thing. Um, they never really want to see you again. I mean, they mm. say, you know, when you come to England, you must have yeah. dinner with me or you must have a drink mm. with me. But they don't really want to see you no. again. Well, I didn't know that. <laughs> and mm. so I sent him a card saying, well, I'm here now. So the poor man had to invite me when he had all his young uh, family, his young cousins, the, the young princes. And, you know, my husband was there and Prince William and Prince Richard of Gloucester were there. And, and you know, all the sort of young... Mm -hmm. I met my husband there, but he had some girl in tow, so I didn't pay much attention to him. I became rather friendly with Prince William of Gloucester, who yes. died, you'll remember, in an aeroplane yes. uh, a crash, which he was racing a small aeroplane or some sort of an aeroplane race. And, um, and, but we always went out in groups then. Mm. It was a sort of group yeah. going out. You know, it was mini skirts, it was tights. I came to England for one month at first in June, and I brought back with me to Austria. When we did have a place to dance after dinner, but we waltzed. I yes. came to, my first night in London was spent at Annabelle's. I thought, this is nice, you know, this <laughs> is nice. And mm -hmm. my next day I was taken to Ascot. Mm -hmm. And we had racing in Vienna, mm -hmm. but I thought, this is nice, you mm -hmm. know, this is nice. I thought, yes, I will study in England. I like England, you know, after mm -hmm. the summer, I'll mm -hmm. come back and study here. and. Um, and then I came back and I, I'd met all these young and, and we all kept in touch and, and we sort of went out. I didn't pay a lot of attention to It was to swinging London. Because he, he always had very fast, low cars. Mm -hmm. So he sort of had Ferrari and he had an Alsatian dog mm. which took up the front seat. So whatever girl he was taking out, I could see squashed in the sort of Ferrari doesn't have much of a a back area, no. but the Alsatian would sit, you know. Mm. And it was a very friendly Alsatian, but nonetheless, I thought that wasn't sort of a very good deal. I had a better deal with the others, I thought, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But I knew him. I always saw yes. him. And he was around, and he was very funny. I think that's what struck me most, mm. that he had a great sense of humor, very deprecating sense of humor. I mean, he wouldn't mm. wait for yeah, people to laugh. He'd sort of move on. Yeah. And then some people would get it and fall about in a heap. Mm -hmm. and, and it was a sort of witty time. Very, really. very droll, quiet yes, English sense very of humor. Quiet. Yeah. But um, as I say, there was always some girl in tow. And um, so I didn't pay any attention. And then he went to Cyprus. Um, with United Nations mm -hmm. forces. And um, he came back in that glorious summer, where you hear of 1976, where the sun shone every day and everybody's mm -hmm. gardens looked like Africa. <laughs> and and uh, except mine, because I had a walled garden, very high walls, at the end of a cul-de-sac, the garden, at the end of the cul-de-sac. And I had some trees, it was lovely. So people liked to come to me for lunch. And I had a sort of lovely Italian, daily who'd make salad and pasta and whoever turned up had lunch you know and he'd um, just come back from that and he was uh, studying for his um, majors exam and um, very intensively because he didn't enjoy it very much mm -hmm. and um, didn't go out at night but but was prepared to go out at lunchtime. And so I suppose I was a good spot to have lunch. And <laughs> so he joined many others oh who would no. come and have salad and pasta in my garden, play a bit of croquet on the lawn or something. And suddenly, white flowers would arrive. Now, I happen to love white flowers. And I thought, well, that's very nice of mm -hmm. him to know that I, uh, that's very nice because we didn't talk flowers at all. And 
I met him uh, again going to a friend's lunch party, also in a garden at Cheney Walk. And we arrived at the same time. Oh, hello, how are you? I'm fine. But what's new with you? I've just given up smoking. I'm suffering. Oh, God, I've just given up smoking. I'm suffering too. So we chatted throughout lunch in her garden. And then whenever he wanted a cigarette, he would ring me and say, please tell me not to smoke. It's like AA. And I said, you're not to smoke, because if you smoke, then I'll smoke, and then you've ruined my not smoking. So we helped each other like this, and, and then he'd have lunch. And then Mount Batten would say, I hear you have lunch regularly with me. Mm, yes, do, very nice, salad and pasta, very, very, very nice. You know. He said, well, you should send her flowers. She likes white flowers. Send her white flowers. White flowers start to arrive. And then, um, what have you given her lately? Next time he saw him, well, why should I give her anything? Well, because you have lunch there all the time. I know, because other people tell me. She'd like this book, this sort of book she'd like. And so a very appropriate book, which would interest me, would, uh, would arrive. So I think, well, it's good taste in, good taste in, in books, you know? And then, then, um, then he passed his exams. And then, um, you should take to see this play. She'd like this play. And he played Cyrano de Bergerac, you know? Oh, would she? And then we'd go six of us. He'd invite other friends, never alone. Six of us to the theatre, and then six of us to. He said, "You know, she likes concerts. She take her to this concert. Well, I don't like concerts." He said, "Well, she'd like Mozart. Go on, take her to Mozart. You like Mozart?" Huh? He said, "Go to concerts, but more to the theatre." So, so Mount Batten was really orchestrating all the this. whole thing. I the whole see. thing, because knowing my family, he thought that I would be appropriate for him, that I would look after him. I, see. I only learned this much later, that I would cherish him and look after him. So after about two years of this, um, Mount Batten said to him one day, you should marry that girl. And he said, well, I can't. Why not? She's Catholic. So then he said to me, you should marry that boy. Which one? <laughs> you know, mm. that one. I can't. It's against the law. I'm Catholic. Um, I'll talk to the Queen. Mm. And, and he did. And the, the royal lawyers uh, worked out that we didn't have to. I mean, no, no, the law didn't say we couldn't marry abroad. Mm -hmm. So that was quite nice for me to marry in Vienna, you know, at home mm -hmm. in a way. Um, but the whole performance took about five years, you know. And we were only engaged for one month because although we'd been planning to marry and the family knew for some time, um, apparently. It was the sort of done procedure that Princess Margaret's divorce had to happen first. One shock for the British public at mm -hmm. a time. You know, a royal divorce and then <gasps> a Catholic in the family. And what I didn't know until the wedding day and after the wedding, that Mountbatten took me aside and, and said, now when you come back from your honeymoon, which he had arranged in India, but before we left, he took me aside and said, now when you come back, you're going to tell the Queen you're going to change your religion. I said, I yeah, can't. Who said this to you? Mount Batten, you know. He said, no, you're going to go and tell the Queen you're going to change your religion. And I said, I can't do that. And he said, well, you must. And I said, well, I can't. Mm -hmm. Why not? I said, my mother would kill me. Well, you, and you're a reasonably serious Catholic anyway, aren't you? Um, yes, but yeah. I mean, it wasn't that. It was that, you know, if it had been the, the law, and I said, I said is, is the Queen going to announce to the public, the English public, that it is her wish, her command, that I change? I mean, you know, I would go and talk to my cardinal, and I would mm -hmm. talk to my mother, and I would uh, discuss this, if, if, if this is the law, you know, because it is the law. But no, 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 no. I had to see the light hallelujah and be converted, you mm -hmm. see. And I couldn't disbelieve my entire upbringing. I mean, we had a Jesuit who who brought mm. us up because but my but brother... But how was it all sorted out? Because you didn't change religions in the end. Well, um, sorted out it wasn't, is the answer. Ah, you just went ahead and married. Y you're a, a monarchical historian, and you're connected in many ways to other... But that's not the families. reason. That's not no, the no, reason. No, I, 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 I'm no, I'm, but I'm going to ask you a different question. You, you uh, both as a historian and in your own life, you have observed a great deal of evolution of the status of the monarchical concept. Are, are you an optimist about it now? Uh, I mean, as an institution. I, I don't mean the British one particularly. No. I assume it's quite secure, um, but in general. It's very hard to say because, you know, if I speak as a historian or as I, if I speak as someone who'd very much like the monarchy 
to obviously to continue. I think monarchy has to be constitutional. Mm -hmm. It can't be autocratic. It must mm -hmm. be constitutional. And that means powerless mm -hmm. in the sense of real power like Parliament has. Mm -hmm. But that being said, um, monarchy has great influence. Mm -hmm. I mean, no one can doubt the influence that the Queen has, mm -hmm. enormous influence. Um, and I think the role of monarchy today really is to set an example um, and to be a unifying force, mm -hmm. to be an iconic unifying force. Because after all, presidents come and go, don't they? Mm. Um, uh, prime ministers come and go. Uh, there are um, governments are upset and, and times sure. change and so on. So to have something that's steady and continuing is, I, I think, a very, very good thing for people, for, for the public, mm -hmm. that they can count on um, as being solid, safe, stable, and always believing in the same values. Um, I think that's a very good thing. So an icon, if you like. Mm -hmm. And are, are the other European monarchies, I mean, they're all, uh, I, I know there are perturbations here and there, but they're all doing all right, aren't they? At the moment? <laughs> no, I'm not going to answer that. Uh, well, most of them are doing all right then. <laughs> Aha. All right. I'm, uh, you must understand I'm not trying to mousetrap you. I'm just trying to Whoa. present questions <laughs> that I'm would be interesting to viewers. But I'm a historian of the past. You know, mm. I would never write about anyone even of no, no, the 20th I, of century. No, not no, even the 20th that. century. But, you know, it's very interesting to see the public interest, even in the Hohenzollerns now in Germany, mm. you know, and of course they've been gone for nearly a century as a, as a ruling family. But I think that, <coughs> that people love the romantic side of history, mm -hmm. don't they? I yeah. mean, they love the sort of, you know, when they think of Neuschwanstein, all those glorious castles, yes. and, and uh, I mean, I think people have a very romantic, that's what fairy stories are about, aren't they? I mean... Well, look, look at the immense media interest and even recent phenomena. I'm not getting into the personalities here, but, you know, the, the last royal wedding in this country. I mean, you had astonishing publicity of it all over the world. Yes, yeah. I mean, I think that everybody has something in them from their childhood that wants um, good to triumph over evil, um, that wants... All young girls want to be swept up by a d'Artagnan. Uh, well, of course they do. I mean, this is, <laughs> this is, this is romantic, and, and, um, and I think that's perfectly normal and acceptable. Yes, you know? yes, it is. But they want heroes. People want heroes. Mm -hmm. They want heroes. And they are rather disappointed in politicians, too, with a few exceptions. <sighs> well, I suppose politicians also have to pass some pretty tough... Um, law sometimes, which may mm. be for the good of the people, but not for their pleasure. Mm -hmm. So I, I would think to be in politics must be one of the most thankless it's a terrible jobs, occupation. really. Yeah. And, and as Enoch Powell said, it almost always ends badly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Except where you have term limits, as in, in you know, President Eisenhower and President Reagan left office in good health and good condition with the voters. but. Other than that, everybody goes out on a, on a down note, you know, even great leaders like Mr. Churchill or de Gaulle or Adenauer or Margaret Thatcher yes. that left rather unsatisfactorily. But isn't it strange how after time people tend to, um, the, the heroes of yesterday become the villains of today very often. I mean, mm -hmm. people that you read glorious things about not long after their death, then with time sort of nitpicking, historians will say, oh, yes, but he did this, so, and he did that. I mean, uh, But you get the reverse. You get, you get the lionization of former demons. You see the, the mm -hmm. rise and rise of Richard Nixon now. That's what he deserves. Yes, yes. You know, he well, was look a very at good Stalin person. as being eulogized he, in That will be a hard sell to get him all the way up there, though. Yes, but look what he did. Did. I, I mean, you know, he was a know. horrifying man. And, and uh, I mean, Lenin, too. I mean, awful people <laughs> well, suddenly. I mean, but he's kind of I out mean, of favor now, isn't he? I mean, communism isn't really. Some frightful you know, it's a bit people. Passe, isn't it? And, and the, end up being eulogized. You know, southern Germany well. There's, you know, tremendous interest in visiting Hitler's. I don't know Hitler's, southern uh, Germany well at all, really. No, but, well, but you're, you're from near there, you say. But they, uh, I mean, Bohemia's Ten not times far. in my <laughs> life to have been to Munich. No, but there's but huge interest in going to Hitler's 
eagle's nest at Berchtesgaden. Well, I read that. Yeah. I've not seen yeah. any of that, but, but I read that. Well, it would be interesting. It doesn't mean that they are actually uh, yes, sympathetic. I mean, no. Yes, I mean, you know, Vlad the Impaler invariably <laughs> turns up, doesn't he? You know, I remember when I was getting married, there wasn't time for the British public, really, to look into anything of my background except my Catholicism, because that's all for one month that the newspapers dwelt on. Mm. And the fact that I descended from Dracula. But I don't. <laughs> my husband is a direct descendant of Dracula. <laughs> I descend from Dracula's half-brother, Drat the Monk, for uh, your information. Very virtuous and, member of the family. And because yeah. Queen, Queen Mary, you know, yeah. through Queen Mary, um, he descends from Dracul, the Drac, which means the chief, you know. Yeah. All right, he impaled lots of people, but lots of people impaled people at sure. that time. He yeah. just probably was worse than most. <laughs> but, but um, you know, it's, it's um, even, even such horrible people as, as that are turned of, to become Frankenstein. And, then, and mm. then even Frankenstein, through Mary Shelley, I suppose, becomes a hero in a funny well, way. Well, at least, at least curiosities and movies and things, yes. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, we will look for your book, A, a Queen the, of Four Kingdoms. The the, qu the Queen of Four Kingdoms. And it's the first of a trilogy covering, first of a trilogy covering a century. Covering the 15th century, and the second book comes out in October a year, so just in 11 months, and the third a year later, because do, I've written the second. Do you have a second. Canadian publisher? I beg your pardon? Do you have a publisher in Canada? I don't. Please, may I have one? Yeah, it's I, a I think thrilling we, I, book. I think we could manage that. Lots of, lots of violence and oh, lots no, of love. Oh, no, I your books. No, your books are splendid. Books are splendid. I'm an avid reader. You love all my books. And of course I do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much Thank for being with us. Thank you so much. <laughs> it was a great pleasure. Always is.